Welcome to Culture Talk. This is the segment where we talk about culturally relevant topics and how you can use them to start conversations about your faith. I'm joined today with special guest, Dr. John Lennox. Thank you for joining us so much. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Yeah, so you're all the way across the pond. You are a emeritus professor of mathematics at Oxford University, and we are so happy to have you here. You've just finished um, working on a film that's coming out soon, Against the Tide. And we, you know, we've watched the, the movie, we love it. Um, the whole premise is to really unpack scientific and theological evidence for God. And I love what you say, um, that the evidence should be what leads us to a decision on whether or not God exists. But we also know that you've debated plenty of atheists who have challenged that. And we have a quote from Dawkins where he says, when you consider the beauty of the world, you almost feel a desire to worship something. What science has now achieved is an emancipation from the impulse to attribute things to a creator. So can you help us unpack that? And are there um, evidences for alternatives to atheism when we consider beauty? Well, frankly, what Dawkins says is quite wrong. Science has not achieved an emancipation of the need to worship something. And the very use of the word emancipation gives the game away. It shows that he feels that that is a repression or a suppression of humanity. Science cannot adjudicate on these things in that sense. But I think the exact opposite is true. The more that science has revealed to us of the magnificent beauty and structure and functioning of the universe, the more I'm inclined to worship the genius of the creator that made it not the less. Uh, and so I feel he's simply wrong there. That's his view, that's his belief system, but I don't think it's founded on very strong evidence. The evidence points the other way. And if I might just add, the pioneers of modern science like Galileo and Newton and Kepler, they took the same view that I've just expressed. And the very motivation for them to do their science was that they believed that there was a lawgiver behind the universe. Right, and I love that, just the idea of coming at science from the perspective of really wanting to explore our creator and explore his creation. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned in Against the Tide is that you don't just answer questions, but you also answer the questioner. And especially now, we're, we're longing for meaning and for purpose. Um, but those who are longing for that and don't quite know God yet, they also need that evidence. So what evidence-based claims do you offer a questioner when they're asking about beauty and they're asking about God? Oh, generic questions are very difficult. Yes. <laughs> it, it depends, as you know, entirely on the person who's asking the question. And that's why you're right. You need to take the question er into account. People start from very different points. Some people need, first of all, some factual information. Mm -hmm. In other words, why would you as a scientist believe in God? And I would point them immediately to the fact that the universe is rationally intelligible. I would talk about the fine tuning of nature. I would talk about the fact that the universe has a beginning and so on. But you mentioned the term meaning. Mm -hmm. Science doesn't give meaning. It can point towards the source of meaning in God, but it doesn't itself give meaning. I, I think there we have to consider two very big things. The first is there is a revelation of God in nature. The heavens declare the glory of God, and we often call that general revelation. But then there's a specific revelation, which is given to us through the Bible, through scripture. And that's where most of the meaning pours in. Because what science cannot tell us is that we are made in the image of God. We're made for a purpose. We have been endowed with the dignity of being given the job of stewards, of, of creation. Now that begins to sort out the meaning question. And of course, you can't ask about meaning 
unless you face questions of the brokenness of, uh, of human experience of the suffering and so on. And that brings one closer to the pinnacle of God's revelation in, in Jesus Christ. Now, when you start thinking about him, you can start at the, in that sense, the historical scientific level. Did he exist or not? You can go to the ancient historians. But in the end, you have to assess whether the claims he made are evidence-based, which I believe they are, and whether they have a ring of truth. And the meaning in the end is only completely to be found when we enter a relationship uh, as human beings. They, highest relationships, the relationships of life, they're the things that give us most meaning with our spouses, with our children, with our relatives, and with our friends. And that points the way to where the source of meaning is found in the person of God. But that takes us away beyond the natural sciences. But I would want to emphasize it doesn't take us beyond rationality. Science isn't the end of rationality at all. And uh, we need to approach these other aspects of existence, history and experience, for instance, in order to get at the meaning questions. Yeah, I love that answer because it actually leads to the next one. And you've kind of answered it in a sense. You're talking about history. And really, when you said that science isn't the end of rationality, when we look at history and we look at um, what we see there and how it points to a historical Jesus, what would be um, something that you would offer the questioner if they're still not too sure and the science has kind of led them to a stopping point as they're looking for meaning? What evidence, as far as history goes, would you point them to? Well, the important thing about history is that we need to consult the ancient historians. They're the experts on this. And there it's quite remarkable because in spite of the fact that many of them are not believers in God, that is, they may be atheists or agnostics, there is widespread agreement about the basic facts of, of Jesus' life, what he did and so on. And even fair consensus about the fact that he had disciples that claimed to have met him after the he was crucified and of course the atheists will stop they don't believe in a resurrection but the amazing thing is that we can gain so much from the ancient historians i mentioned some of them in the film and one of the disadvantages of the film genre is that the questions come pouring out and you can't answer them all so what i'm doing at the moment which might interest your viewers and listeners is I'm writing a companion guide to the film that goes into this particular question and many others in much more depth, giving them actual citations of top ancient historians that build up a real cumulative picture that there's strong evidence for even the strange things that happened, the things we call miracles, the signs. So we've got a strong evidence base that can build up our confidence that what we're dealing with is not fiction, certainly not science fiction, but has a bedrock of history. And that is something on which we can then base our commitments and our experience. Yes, I love that so much, a bedrock. Um, thank you so much for that. I look forward to seeing the companion guide to Against the Tide. For those curious, to find out about film times and how you can watch the movie, go to againstthetide.org.